welcome to Screen Hour with me, Kieran. And me, Malky. The show where we give you our impressions and experiences for films, series, and games. We start by sharing our initial spoiler-free impressions, and we warn you before we deep dive into those spoilers. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to follow us on your preferred platforms with our handle, Screen Hour. This week, we're going to be reviewing and delving into the glorious plastic land of Barbie. As you can imagine, Barbie is about Barbie, played by Margot Robbie, and she's accompanied by Roy Gosling, who plays Ken. And it's not just single Ken and Barbie, there is Plawley, there is many a Barbie and Kens, which is probably one of the main positives of this film, which, which, which we get to. But it is, like a lot of cool, funny films, it is, a lot of it is the fish out of water syndrome, top premise. And it is Margot Robbie's Barbie. He's, she's in Barbie land. And then she travels to the quote-unquote real world. And it's her trials and tribulations of her journey into that and the repercussions of her and Ken experiencing in that. And then Ken's thoughts on after being in the real world and Barbie's thoughts and how they transport back into Barbie land. I won't go much more into that because that'd be spoilers. But what I will say is, I can imagine to like refer back to the old Barbie Hoy or Barbenheimer. Yeah, whatever it wants to be called, as many different people called it, is if I did at the time, I can understand why a lot of people, and funny enough, I was speaking to one of the girls at work, she done it. She watched Oppenheimer first, then Barbie, and. Don't get wrong, there's a few moments in Barbie when it just kind of hit you in the feet, to be fair, it's quite nice like that. But it's definitely a planet cleanser and a lot more fun. And like that's not me being a rocket scientist, don't get me wrong, you don't need to be smart to work that out. But I can fully appreciate that, because this film is just... It's just it's just a delight. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think I'm going to second that. I watched Oppenheimer, watched it a week ago now. And after watching Dead Reckoning and then watching Oppenheimer, I was like, these are like two of the best films this year, let alone the best films we've had for quite a while. And, and then seeing Barbie absolutely smashing the box office and doing better than both of them was really like hurting my soul because like there is no way this film is better than them. And straight off the standpoint, it's not but I completely understand why it's done better. And I think it's done better simply for the fact that it's got the right sort of target audience. You know, it's family friendly, which is a bit like Mission Impossible, but I think Mission Impossible got overshadowed by the whole Barbenheimer sort of thing. And Oppenheimer has uh, got a higher age rating, so it's got a much smaller market share of people being able to go and view it. But the big thing that I took away from seeing Barbie was I think it's this generation's Grease. That's quite a good comparison to be fair. Say it's got that singing and dancing. It's lighthearted, it's fun, and it speaks to the current generation, upcoming generation. I think what you say wouldn't, you know, it's not as good as Mission Impossible and Up in Nightmare. I think. It's it's probably just as good, but it's just a totally different like playing on audience, as you say. I rightly agree with that. Is that you know, I was always gonna watch it just because he was behind it. The cast was pretty solid. Greta Gerwig done Little Women and Lady Bird. They're both really great coming of age like women films, and also like Little Women like her version that was quite I don't know, just interesting but fresh. So I was always quite looking forward to it. But at the same time, like, you know, we do a film podcast and also I don't know anybody because as much as me to the cinemas apart from you, like, again, it's just another weird thing in the sense that we've got a, you look at August now and compared to July, it's just bare. That's Hollywood. I don't know why, why they've done it like that. I can understand, like, Barbie and Homer to a degree, but, like, put Mission Impossible in August? What would have it had to compete with? Yeah, exactly. You could have had the, the IMAX screens. Would have had IMAX all, all fucking month, wanted to. Yeah. I think that's one of the big detriments to to Dead Reckoning is that 
this Barbenheimer came out, what was it, 10 days after? And literally no one's talking about Mission Impossible. They're still, everyone's talking about Oppenheimer and Barbie. And I must admit, I don't know if it's just because of the way my algorithm's working, but all I'm seeing across the internet is camcorder shots of Oppenheimer uh, going, oh, this bit's brilliant, this bit's brilliant, this bit's brilliant. You know, I don't see so much of Barbie anymore. I just see a lot of Oppenheimer stuff. I haven't seen a single Mission Impossible thing for a long time. I say a long time. It's been like nine days since Oppenheimer released, but it's, in social media terms, that's a long time. <laughs> My favourite thing, honestly, about Barbie is just how meta and funny it is, but there's just the social commentary and like how, honestly, I'd say 80% of the jokes landed for me, and they are so like frequent. And like you've said as well, what it does really well is it's a 12A, and it really, like, Smashes that audience slip bracket. Yeah, it goes right up to the line with its humour as well. Yeah, if anybody from like any girl or boy who's from, I don't know, even eight, because like 12 hours, as far as I know, I think, and like you've got to be 12 over over to sit on their own or just to company by an adult. Nah, I'm pretty sure. In, in British ratings, yeah. In British ratings, yeah. So obviously, I wouldn't take like, I wouldn't take a five or six shot, but I'd take like, you know, an eight-year-old up until like 112 or whatever. And it just resonates. I, I just feel like it'll resonate with anyone. With the 12A as well, you're allowed one F-bomb, I believe. And they, I think they used it quite well. It was said by Barbie, Pre- President Barbie, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, she does the old Samuel L. <laughs> Motherf- was it motherfucker? But I think it's mother- motherfuckers, I think it is. Yeah. Also, what I like about this, and don't don't get me wrong, the main like two players of Margot Robbie and Roy Gosling are just what people have said about should they get nominated for Oscars for it, and I honestly kind of think they sh- I don't know I kind of think they should in a way, but I d- I don't know because there's some particular scenes like, and just because it's not a, like a drama or a mega indie film. I think it'll be nice for, like, not an overly arty film who wins something. Like, as much as I like Brendan Fraser in the way, like, I'm yet to watch it, but I, I know people who have or whatever. And it just looks incredibly depressing. And I know that's the point, like, doing it wrong. But it'll be nice for, like, a more... And, you know, there is, like, as I said, bits in Barbie which resonate. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a, like, a more popular, upbeat film win more Oscars, like. Well, Everything Everywhere All at Once was a bit more upbeat. There was a more sort of personal message there, but it was a lot more cheeky and entertaining. Oh, yeah, 100% agree. Like, but that's this year's just gone, man. It like, yeah. yeah. One, one of my favourite things from this film, uh, one of the big takeaways for me that I thought they absolutely nailed was the set design. I thought it was so brilliant and like the little nuances that they did such as, you know, not actually having any water and stuff like that because, you know, when little girls are playing with the dolls, they're playing with a a dry toy, as weird as that sentence sounds out loud, but they're playing with, you know, it's it's all make-believe. Yeah, she's not going to give them orange juice. They're like, the kid's not going to get a plastic doll to drink orange juice because it can't, well, yeah. It's going to make the doll all sticky and mess everywhere, you know, that's, that's how it's done. Um, but the bit that I, I thought oh, they really thought this through, was when, it's right at the beginning of the film, so it's not spoilers, but Ken gets injured in a a beach incident and an ambulance rocks up, right? But as the ambulance rocks up, the ambulance folds open, right? Like you would use a toy. Like, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be able to drive it around, but it sort of like opens itself up so you can use the inside of the ambulance. And I really liked, as soon as I saw that happen, I was like, ah, oh, someone, someone's been using their brain here. Because it just, I was, I was just really impressed with it. I was interested to see where the set design would go from that point on. And, you know, there was a lot of things I did really well. And uh, I can't remember exactly what the budget is now. But I, if I recall, Offenheimer had a hundred million budget. And Barbie had, was like close to $150 million budget. And I'm like, how the hell? 
did Barbie cost more to make than Oppenheimer? Considering Oppenheimer was real sets, real locations, whereas Barbie is all staged work and all that. But then when I kind of saw the film, kind of understood where the budget went in trying to make all of this sort of over-exaggerated set designs and... There was just a lot of work that went into it, so I could understand on that level, like, okay, I understand where that budget's gone on, on this and on, on, on that. And plus, I think, as well, they're going to use a fair bit of budget because they have a lot of musical choreography numbers and they're going to get people writing, you know, and performing these songs, which costs more to do than to get one composer to create an entire soundtrack as well so there's there's a lot of other things where i can see like oh that's what that would have cost more for this and that would have cost more for that but um to take budget into co- into consideration it makes you really appreciate how much nolan was able to do with his budget but that's not the film we had to talk about as i said the one thing that really stood out for me like you know you've got margot's performance and then you've got ryan's performance but the set design for me was something that actually really surprised me i think you mentioned it briefly, like nuance, but like I think the combination of like campiness and the nuance, both it will be like the performances or like you said, the attention to detail, whether it be on the set or whether it be the like performances or just like the smart writing. He honestly like tiptoes and walks the line of just being, like I said, having that nuance to detail and the little bits you see. And just the overall campiness and fun of the film is just great. Like, like apparently, I oh, like I think I read an article or listened to somewhere they'd ran out of pink in California or, or something like that when they were doing the Barbie sets. And yeah, just you know, looking at the trivia, here, Barbie is twenty three percent larger than everything in Barbie Land to mimic the awkward disproportion scale that real Barbie sets are produced in. This is why Barbie sometimes appears too large for things like a car or why ceilings seem too low in the Dream House. Yeah, just stuff like that. It's, yeah, there's studies done a couple of years ago about the funny, like, I don't know, the overarching plot, the like, storyline of patriarchy versus matriarchy, whatever, of that if Barbie was a real person, she just wouldn't work. Like, Her waist and everything, yeah, she'd just snap and fall over. And just stuff like that. So I always thought that was interesting. Like, you've picked up on, like, both performances are really cool. But, like, you know, another little trivia fun thing is, according to Ryan Gosling, he accept the role of Ken after seeing his daughter's Ken doll lying face down in the mud next to a squash lemon. He then took the shot of the doll and sent it to Greta Gerwig, saying, I shall be your Ken, his story must be told. So it's <laughs> just Ryan Gosling's just, like, a fun but semi-serious approach to that, and that's, like, one of the three lines of the whole film is really good. Bearing in mind we can't, and we're very self-aware. We can't comment too much on what it's like to be a lady watching this film. But all I really appreciated is the perspective of Barbie talking to the mother character in it. America Ferrara. She plays a ugly bay. Yeah, she plays ugly bear. But their free interactions is like some of the highlights of the film for me. I honestly just... I don't know what I expected. I expected... it. I expect it to be good because of the cast who were attached to it and the director attached to it. Because I know Noah Baumclamp, uh, I think it's Greta Gerwig, with husband as well, partner. He wrote it with her. And his writing's bloody good. Like, for any for reference, frame of reference, he wrote Marriage Story, which came out a few years ago with Scott Jantz and Adam Driver. So, again, I knew, I expected it to be quite good, but it's just a lot better than I expected. It really was. I expected it to be like Lego Movie. Is, is how I envisioned it because Lego Movie was meant to be this sort of wacky thing that you're not really meant to take too serious. It's meant to be, you know, like a child's thing and and just, you know, something entertaining. But at the end of the day, there's a bigger heart and a bigger message there to be told. The thing for me with Lego Movie is you're, you're watching it and you're, you're enjoying it for what it was and then it was the bit when the world sort of zoomed out and you realise that it's... Will Ferrell playing with the Lego figures and he's not allowing his son to mess with them and that's why they've got all these random characters that are involved because he's ruined this perfect world. And that's how I sort of imagined Barbie would be. And I, I don't think I was too far off. 
I mean, what also helped was Will Ferrell was also in this as well. So uh, that sort of helped, uh, you know, bridge the gap between the two for me there. It is very similar to Lego Movie, I, I feel, because it is, you know, it, it's creating a, a bigger message, a broader message to young girls. And it's a message that I think a lot of anti-feminists have big complaints about. There are those that think this film is trying to shit on all of the men and that they are the enemy to the women. But if I think if that is what you think this film is, you didn't give it time to explain itself and you misinterpreted what the message was. And maybe that's because after seeing like the first anti-male joke, you'd already like turned your nose up at the rest of the film and you just chose to ignore any other point that was trying to make. It's, yes, there are jokes made at the expense of a man, but how many jokes are in films that are made at expense of a woman? You know, it's it's a, it's a to-in and fro-in sort of thing. It's It's back and forth. Don't take it to heart. I could have completely misinterpreted to it too. You know, what I'm saying here is not the be-all or the end-all, it's just my own opinion. But I think the message they're trying to say, just be you. Don't, well, actually, that's probably a bit spoiler talk, actually. But, you know, just do what you want to do and be who you want to be. Don't let, you know, just because Barbie was designed this particular way, she has to be like this. That's not what the message is. The message is, be who you want to be and do what you want to do. Don't let, you know, others tell you how you should live your life. Despite the social context or the wider world, like like Kieran says, that's what one of the main moral of the story is, but the main message of the film is, and that's what's quite feel good about it also, especially towards the later part of the film, like Act 3. But it's... Kieran's like comparison to Lego movies, not it's not too far off. But if I was to recommend somebody to watch either one, it'll definitely be Barbie. Because it's just Barbie is more grown up, I think. I think it's just so much yeah, Barbie's more grown up, it's a lot smarter. I was I was thinking about this earlier. I was like, would I be able to recommend my dad to watch Barbie? And I was like, I reckon I could get him to watch Barbie. Like, I don't the the thing is, I think I'd struggle trying to get him to initially watch it, but I think after he watched it, it'd be like, yeah, that was quite fun, actually. I did enjoy that. Whereas trying to get him to watch Lego Movie would be a harder job, I think, because there's more adult themes in Barbie, so there's more to sort of connect with and laugh with, if you know what I mean. Such, such as, you know, when you watch shows when you were a kid and all the adult things just, like, went over your head. And then when you watch them again when you're an adult, you're like, I don't remember this joke. I don't remember that joke. Uh, that's, like, that's so crude. How did I not pick up on this as a kid? It's because you're so innocent-minded. Um, whereas, you know, there's a lot of those sort of jokes in, in, in Barbie, and that's why, as I say, it does appeal to a, a more mature audience as well as, you know, young girls that uh are interested in barbie i guess i say that i don't know if people still are interested in barbie do people still buy barbies i honestly don't know but uh to piggyback on what you were saying just i just think whatever attitude you go in with this film it's it's only gonna back that point up like if you be open going into it and i can almost promise you you will just enjoy it if you go in like kieran says if you think oh they're making like you know, I know particularly the it was only going over the net about the Zack Snyder Justice League joke. I particularly, being someone who actually thinks the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League is 110% better than the original, and I won't go on it too much, obviously, I'm to a degree the target of said joke, and I thought that was great. Yeah, it was, it's water off a duck's back. You know, everything gets t- the fears taken out of it. Don't take everything to heart. Like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. You watch this, you are like, oh, you are watching some girlfriend or whatever, and you you come out come out offended. I think you've bigger issues you need to ask yourself if you come away from this film being offended. But it should lead us nicely into spoilers.
Before we do dive into spoilers, we're going to give this a green badge. You need to go experience it as soon as you can, and we'll expand further in a moment or two. We'd also like to take this time to sincerely thank you for listening to us, and if you would like to participate in an episode, you can leave your thoughts on what you'd like to see us cover next in the comments below, or through our Instagram. Remember you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and Instagram with our handle Screen Hour. Now it's time to get into those spoilers. My main thing I liked about it was how it was incredibly meta and just absolutely mugged everybody up. You could see why Ken done what he'd done. It was very evident that the film honestly could boil down into like literally this sentence of matriarchy. Very heavy Barbie Land matriarchal world. Kane comes out to a over exaggerated, but probably not too over exaggerated. Depends on which part of the world you go to or whatever. I don't want to get too into that. He goes to their version of the real world with over enforced patriarchy. He comes back and forces the patriarchy. No archy could be the ideal world. And that's what it comes down to, if you ask me. And that's what the film kind of the message gets across. And like Kieran said, the other one, and this is what I like about it so much, is they really entwine with each other. Is that you can, if you just be you, you'll be fine, and people will support you. Don't worry about everybody else's perspective or what they think of you. Don't worry about the wider context of life. Just enjoy, be yourself, and don't you don't have to try and fit in or be a cock for the sake of being a cock or anything like that. And I also, also, like this, is, this was, could have been non spoilers, like Kieran said, is some of the dance numbers in particular. I'm just Ken Ball, Ryan Gosling. I probably listened to watch the film on Monday, Thursday evening now. I probably listened to that film like six times, the uh, film, um, six times. I listened to it straight after. I listened to the soundtrack straight after on the drive to uh, home. And I listened to I'm just Ken straight after. And Billy Eilish is odd. Uh, I found out what that track's called now. The her one, Alma Feeling. But that's just like really slowed down and quite melancholy and quite lovely. And it's just, I don't know, it's quite a different, it's quite a, the contrast to I'm Just Ken. But again, I'm Just Ken is a bit, you listen to it, you know, and the time in the film where it's getting played. Quite emotional, like. So I don't know. I absolutely just, I just loved it. I, I, I thought it was great. Ken's like, Use the rest in terms as we likely do, and I think Kieran, if I remember correctly, even texted me this because I watched it first. Doesn't Ken turn heel, then face in the film? And honestly, yeah, that's oversimplifying it, but yes, he does. But what's so great about it is both of those turns are so justified. Yeah, a bit of like bad metaphor here. About 10 years ago, Big show in WWE was just turning heel and face every two minutes. And it was just, just not justified. And it just made no sense to be like really simple character storytelling. Where in this f- film, like Ken's heel to face turn is just absolutely smash luck. I, I, I like how it, they don't overplay his simple mindedness either. Yeah, exactly. No, just because he's pretty or, you know, and Barbie's pretty as well. I mean, I, arguably, you know, Barbie is smarter than Ken, and I think that's by design. You know, they don't overplay Ken's simple mindedness to be like, oh yeah, all men are dumb and women are smarter. You know, they didn't overplay that card and overplay that hand at all. I wanted to say earlier, but then I was like, actually, no, that's too spoilerish. Is, you know, right at the end of the film, they say, uh, you know, as, as I've mentioned, it's about being you and, and one. And, and not being who everybody else wants you to, to be. Choose your own path and make your own destiny. And just because Ken and Barbie are designed to be together doesn't mean they have to be together if that's not something you want. And that's, like, a message. Yeah, it's probably one of my favourite writing decisions is that they're not together at the end. I like you said, that was a bit, like pretty big spoiler, I suppose, to the point where that's kind of what you expect. And that again, that's one of the reasons I liked it so much is that you know, the tagline is the film is like, Barbie, she's everything, he's just Ken. You know, it's, he learns that, you know, he doesn't have to just be Barbie's accessory, he can be Ken in his own right. And to that point where he, he doesn't have to be physically with Barbie. Yeah. And the only reason you'd see this as a 
as a fully feminist film and shitting on all the men, it's it's purely because we're seeing it from Barbie's perspective. If we were seeing it from the other perspective, then we'd be, you know, the film would be ending with Ken realising that he doesn't need Barbie and he can decide his own future. But because this is Barbie's film, you know, you don't see that. So that's why you think, oh, it's all shitting on men and, and all of that. All the characters are just incredibly charming when they need to be and camp. Even like, just the silly, uh, I'll tell you what I did not expect, and, you know, shout out to any loyal listeners, but uh, me and uh, Kieran absolutely loved, and one of our, dare I say it, more popular episodes, is SAS Rogue Heroes, and I think his IRL name is... Connor Swindles. Connor Swindles is in it, and he, like, has quite a minor role, don't get me wrong, but his slapstick camp performance is, like, just again, it's a bit of a minor role, but he's absolutely great in it. What, what I would say is, like, Will Ferrell is doing very much Will Ferrell, but that's not a bad thing because it doesn't overshadow the film. Sometimes it can, but this time it didn't. Margot Robbie just conveys, again, I don't want to pretend to have the perspective of a, of a woman, but her like, arc and her being, especially at the start of the film, undeniably happy charming and fun and then like, towards the the end of the second act per se her like depression state and how like shit things can be for women during like a patriarchal society I can imagine that is rather dog shit at times and she just absolutely smashes that and she's just and again it leans into how good and meta the storytelling is obviously anybody with always know how knows how beautiful Margot is but again how smart the storytelling is like uh, Helen Mirren like, alludes to like Helen Mirren alludes to as the narrator there's a bit in it where she turns around and she goes I'm not pretty I don't feel pretty and it doesn't matter what you look like people have that with his body dysmorphia or eating disorders whatever don't get wrong I won't go too deep into it and you know she conveys that wholeheartedly really well but the meta story funny storytelling just she just turns around and she goes Note to filmmakers, don't get Margot Robbie to portray not being pretty because she's stunning. And it's that juxtaposition is what makes the joke so wild. Is like, I don't want to ever explain a joke too much because you'd ever explain a joke too much. Kurt. But you're in, you're in spoilers, so I hope you've seen this bit. Is that her performance nails it, but she is beautiful. So that, that's what makes it good. That's what makes it fun. Look. I think what's, what's also really, uh, what I think, uh, yeah, I could be way off base here, but. I feel like this is very much a Margot Robbie production. I feel like she's got everyone around her that she's wanted to work with and wants to work with, you know, because I think it was Margot that wanted Ryan Gosling because I saw something in the interview where he stopped a fight or something with random people, and it wasn't like, oh, it's Ryan Gosling stopping a fight. It's just like, you know, I'm just a guy trying to stop somebody from fighting or something, and this went viral a couple of years, years or so ago now this happened and she saw that and she said oh right Ryan Gosling must be a really good guy and that's who we need to play Ken right and then of course she's got Emma Mackey who the world seemed to think her doppelganger uh, from Sex Education but then along with that you got um, Shooty as well and you've got Connor Swindles from Sex Education so there's quite a bit of a cast there and then you got a big old surprise from John Cena and I know her and John Cena get on really well and of course, they work together on Suicide Squad. So I think she's gotten a lot of people together that she just wants to work with, and she enjoys, you know, being around. And I think at the end of the day, that's what I, was one of the biggest strengths of this film was having those people she can work with and have good chemistry with, which sold the film. And I think her work with America Ferrara as well like her particular character was really good and i you know you could say when she goes off on her feminist rant speech with all the different barbies you know if you really want to be that sort of person but i think it was a really good speech and i think it was really well done and i think that will, that actual that speech itself will resonate with a lot of women yeah well it resonated with me to a certain degree like and dare i say i'm not you know i'm not a woman like in or a mother or a mother like 
and it's again this is what I'm, i can't praise it enough is that you know it's killed the barbie film i'm going out on a limb here it's more targeted to, to women but it resonated with me it's so many like punch degree and it you do come out of it it's like we had the discussion not discussion because we was just over text but me and Kieran said about it being thought provoking it and I said it's what's quite interesting with Oppenheimer is that it's a it's a very different kettle of fish, but it's more thought provoking in the grander scheme of things of an external existential crisis, <laughs> depression, existential crisis, and it gives you, it gives you depression like that, where the thought provoking from Barbie comes to yeah, don't get me wrong, you can think about the ext- external version of the patriarchy or whatever, which is very evident. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you think you can think of it as the sense of everybody, if you're not a woman, you have a mother, a girlfriend, a wife, a sister. And you just think you can think about that and more internally and more personal. So it's quite interesting that two very different films and don't get me wrong, you can you can even say hit films are semi thought provoking. But I think they're both very fault provoking because they are such good films and they're probably not like there's probably very few similarities between them but i'd think that is such a big one where both of them i came out thinking a lot of different things especially towards the end i don't like again good old imdb trivia this section where barbie thinking about life in general and it's got women growing up and girls playing and things like that. That was all camera footage of the cast and crew. The archived footage, yeah, yeah. I thought I, I figured it was the cast and crew. And I just thought that was like a lovely touch. Because originally I thought that was a young Margot, and I was like, wait, no, there's too, diff- there's too many different characters here, so it was like, this is going to be cast and crew footage. Something I really liked was just, like Kieran said, the, the sisterhood element of it was just, I don't know, that was really... It was lovely, like, in a certain way. And it wasn't too pushed. All the speeches and the writing was just gold. I think, and like Kieran's touched on with Ryan Gosling and Emma Mackey and just the cast in general. Probably as much as I like Dead Reckoning, I, you you come away with that, and especially because I've been watching the Mission Impossible films and just using these comparisons because they're very fresh, is that Dead Reckoning is more like Tom Cruise's and the Hayley Atwell's film. Where this, don't get me wrong, is Ken and Barbie's, but they see it's it's quite a good ensemble film. Like a lot of the, the cast and the chemistry just gels very well in this. And I'd also say, I'd probably say Margot Robbie, probably ten years ago now is when she really hit the stratosphere with like Wolf of Wall Street. And she's probably don't get me wrong. If you look at her IMDb, she's probably in things before then. But that's when she fucking really made it. And I'd say this is probably her best film. It's, it's definitely her highest grossing. It's definitely her highest grossing piece of piss, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's probably my favourite film of hers. Don't get wrong, she's been in some fucking good films. Like I said, Wolf Wall Street's classic, modern classic. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, in Hollywood is great. That's my favourite one of hers, but she's not really in it. She's probably only in it for 25 minutes at the very most. I mean, at the very most. Probably closer to, I don't know, 20. But what I remember, the Bill Eilish song is called What What Was I Made For? One of my, um, one of the surprises that I really thoroughly enjoyed was the appearance of Rhea Perlman, who is Danny DeVito's wife. And she's, uh, you know, like the last thing I can recall ever seeing her in was Matilda. You know, and her character in this is so completely opposite to Matilda, but so very identical to who she really is. And I just, I just adore her as a person, uh, as well as Danny DeVito. I think like they're some of the best humans on this planet. Um, especially when you know what they did for Mara Wilson, uh, who played Matilda. Uh, I think, yeah, it was she was such a good person to have as the. The face behind Barbara, or Barbie, should I say? Yeah, I just think it was a great addition that she she just popped in out of nowhere. You know, wait a minute, 
And you just knew there was going to be more to her than meets the eye because I was like, you're not going to put her just in that little moment and then Barbie runs off like, you know, she's going to come back and be like, I am the creator of Barbie. And you're like, wait, what? You're like, you, you, you knew that was coming sort of thing. She's a very warm character and she smashes that. I know. And uh, there's a line that she says that I really, I, I quite liked and, and uh, that sort of resonated me was... Um, we stand still so our daughters can see how far they've come. Yeah. I really like that visual imagery. I can, like, you know, picture it in my head as your parents, they take the brunt of the weight of everything for you and shelter you to allow you to spread your wings and move on. And then it's only when the kid turns around to look back, see where you are, they can realize, you know, how far they've spread and how far they've gone. And, take pride and, and be proud of what it is they've achieved. Uh, yes, I really enjoyed that line. I think it's such a well-written line. It's almost like an observation like to a degree. It, that's why I think it's so good. It's just, yeah, it's, it's very on the nose without being shit. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not corny. It's that, That's the thing. It's not corny. Yeah, exactly. I 100% agree. But you have to, at the end of the day, you've got to give props to Mattel. Because they have completely turned around what Barbie is. You know, originally Barbie was meant to be this, well, I say not me meant to be, you know, I don't know if it's, it was originally marketed or, or whatever, you know, I haven't been around since the beginning of the Mattel and I've never really played with Barbies. Action Man, yeah, but I've never played with Barbies. You know, Barbie was originally meant to be, you know, beauty standards and this is what women should look like or whatever. But in this film, it's all about no, 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 it's not about that. It's just about being the perfect version of who you are, the perfect version of yourself and be who you want to be. And it's completely changed the narrative of who Barbie is. And it's it's an absolute blinder, to be honest, because the Barbie sales are going to go through their absolute fucking roof. I saw a thing a few months ago saying, oh, with Barbie coming out, you should buy shares in Mattel. Because once Barbie comes out, the shares are going to go skyrocket. I'll tell you what, I should have fucking done it because I'll be a rich man by now. <laughs> Mortgage who? It paid off in full. <laughs> like I said, and what we've touched on is the ensemble cast of them being like betraying almost every facet and version of Barbie and Ken. That is just great. Where it'll be like, different race, races of Barbie and Ken, different different sizes, and Barbie having different ambitions and roles and jobs. I think that's just great, and it really plays into that. Have you got much more to say? Oh, that's what I was going to say, is I just hope, I know that other podcasts have touched on this, and but I hope to God Hollywood just don't start turning out every film based on a toy now. I know this one, there's an A24 horror version of Barney coming out, for God's sake. Barney the Purple Dinosaur. Yeah, they're going to make a horror film like that. But I hope now they're not going to make an Action Man one. Maybe not Action Man, but I want to see Captain Scarlet. Dun, 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 dun. Captain Scarlet. Look, I know for a fact we're telling making a Hot Wheels feel, film, which is like J.J. Abrams is attached to it. So I'm just like, all oh, just stupid shit like that. And what made this so good is like how much of a fresh take it was to put people behind it in the performances and we've just went over what made it good for the last half hour don't get wrong but I just hope they don't run the premise into the ground and make it fall flat I completely agree with you and it's, it's not a perfect film but because I knew going in that this is not going to be my favourite film I've ever seen so I relaxed my expectations so yes there are flaws and there are problems here and there, but they're things that you kind of like, it's that sort of film, just go with the flow and just enjoy it for what it is. At the end of the day, I will say I much preferred Oppenheimer, and I think Oppenheimer is a much better film. It is an incredible film. Um, Barbie is just a fun and enjoyable film. You know, the, the whole, it's not necessarily... Barbie versus Oppenheimer, it is Barbenheimer. They are one and the same, apparently, or whatever. But, yeah, Oppenheimer is absolute fucking leagues uh, better. I really I, I really don't think it is. I think... Then you're wrong. 
it, it really, it really is. They're too different. Like you, apart from the social media, you know, the general public you made the whole versus them or make it, them getting released on the same weekend, and people watching it, that became a bit of a joke, a bit of a laugh. It was great for cinema. It was great for cinema, but most people would not watch them. I honestly think, if I was to recommend a film, I would, if I had to recommend one, unless I knew the person, I'd, I'd recommend Barbie. Easy. Because unless you, like, you're a true Nolan fan, or you particularly like dramas, or you're a sadomachitist who likes to be upset, and, <laughs> uh, you know, because that, and that's nothing to take away of how good Oppenheimer is, but a Barbie's just a f- more of a fun film. I did say in the, op- the Oppenheimer episode that we did, I said, you know, the Oppenheimer is probably a film that will more so resonate with the Nolan fan base. And you're like, nah, I don't think so. And here you are completely contradicting yourself. No, I don't I mean, did say that. Like, it's not so... Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. I don't think, like, I think everybody, because the reason I said that, if you, out of context, you said that. Yeah, no. Is I, I was referring to everybody would like it, as in, more people than just the Nolan fanboys will like it. And don't get it wrong, like, if you've watched Barbie, you probably will like Oppenheimer to a certain degree because it's just a well-made film, but it's just not a fun film. And I don't think, like, when you say league, league, Oppenheimer's leagues above Barbie, I don't, I don't think it is. I just think it's so different. I think it's better performed, it's better directed. It's I don't think it's better performed. Better script. I don't think it's better before. I don't think the script's better either. Pacing's better. I think the pacing has to be better in Oppenheimer. It's a three-hour film. I think the script is probably, at most, just as good. I think the script's probably better well written in Barbie because it's just everything lands a lot better. We, It's funny, but it still has resonating moments. But I think Oppenheimer's a better like a more well made film just due to Nolan being the director he is being making masterpieces making things more intense making things beautiful but a bit fucking in your face and action paced and smooth but I, I definitely don't think Lee up and always leagues above it as for performances Emily Blunt Killing Murphy and Robert Downey Jr I honestly think them compared to Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie I'd probably go toe to toe. Easy. As actors, sure, but as these particular performances. Nah. Nah. Roy Gosling's performance and Margot Robbie's performance when she has the breakdown on, on par, right up level, level playing. Especially like towards Robert Downey Jr. I honestly think, yeah, he doesn't really have much room to exercise his acting until the very end, really. Of Oppenheimer, Killian, like, but like, Killian is Killian. I think he's such a great actor. Not many actors working now who are that good. And I think Ryan Gosling is probably one of them. If you look at Ryan Gosling's filmography, and you know, he's all over the internet, over Instagram, all Ryan Gosling, literally me. That, that me, even like, it's one of the reasons he was so good at casting for this, is that loads of fucking. The joke is loads of people identify as want to be like loads of blokes want to be Ryan Gosling. It's because he's hit every fucking genre of film. Where Killian, I think for the broader appeal, he's just he's the more like I don't know the more geeky the more geeky film lovers person, you know, and then the odd like mainstream person. He's a character actor. Peaky Blinders, yeah, he's a character actor. And I don't get wrong, I think Ryan Gosling is very much so as well. He's a great fucking actor. But he's covered everything. He's been in a notebook. He's been in Crazy Stupid Love. He's been in Blade Runner 2049. He's been in... Drive. He's been in Drive, which is everybody's favourite indie darling film. Now, there's a time where, like, that film had watched... Like, it was used to be a cult film. But just due to word, word of mouth, that film's fucking gone up. Every man and his dog watched that film because it's great. I don't know. Honestly, he's... He's been in fucking effing. I like him. I didn't say I didn't, did I? Just said the performances in Oppenheimer are better than the performances in Barbie. Nah, I think you judged it too harshly compared to Oppenheimer. Well, that's the whole point. I was comparing them, so that's why I judged them together. Because one of my big questions I was going to ask is, 
do you think Barbie would have done as well as it has if it hadn't come out at the same time as Oppenheimer? This was a question I was going to pose to you before I even saw the outcome of the box office and everything. And I've seen that. I feel like the question is just a moot point. You know, it's because of all the memes and stuff on the internet, you know, did that really bring recognition to both films? You know, did, did it help them both out for the benefit? Or was this just going to ha- happen exactly the way it happened anyway? You know, would they have grossed as much as they did, even if they came out, say, a week apart? I think it definitely helped it purely just because anybody with half a brain knows how different they are. And them being released on the same day only reinforced that idea. And it gave you the fun perspective of maybe seeing them both on the weekend or even on the same day. And also that, as far as I know, I think probably for a Yanks as well, it came out pretty much at the same time as the like, six weeks holidays and shit like that. I went and saw it on a Monday afternoon, like after work, like late afternoon, like five, five, 10 to six precisely, you really wanna. And it was rammed. It was round for a Monday, look. And what you said as well, like we said at the top of the episode, it was going to do better because it's got a broader audience. Back your point up, it definitely helped it. It definitely helped them being being released together and just this. And this is, again, probably yeah, more of a, uh, I don't know, a point you could delve into for about in 25 minutes at least, is don't get wrong, you have sponsored advertising on social media, but social media now, in his own right, whether it would be great podcasts like Screen Hour or whether it would just be people just posting their reviews on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, is it's marketing in its own right now. And whether back in the fucking, I don't know, early 2000s, never more in the 80s and fucking 70s or even the 60s, films wished they had something invented by the internet like Barbie Nightmare to boost both films or what they did. There was no way like that box office wasn't helped for both films without the internet or without the person like I don't know, I don't want to say it was based on done on Reddit or fucking Instagram or something in particular. But the one person who got caught or probably Twitter, Twitter very evidently, who coined it the phrase Arm and Armor or whatever, is probably I don't know. They don't get paid royalties for God's sake, but they smashed it. It's really helped both of them. Well, like they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Take Morbin time, for example, you know. So I'm yet to watch it, but dog shit, no more. No. If it weren't for that whole Morbin time thing, I think it would have done even worse. Yeah. You know, I think people then just watch it out of curiosity. I think, yeah, for, I think for sure it's definitely helped. And as we say, no publicity is bad publicity. Yeah, unless your publicity is involved with allegations, that should be like a disclaimer. Yeah. Of, uh, any publicity is good publicity. Unless it's unless it's an allegation. Unless it's an allegation. Yeah. But I tell you what, like totally like a question which I could have asked you off air. But uh, have you watched First Man? I feel like you would have watched First Man. First Man, yeah, not Nora Goss. Of course I have, it's a space film. That's what I asked you, yeah. I ain't watched it yet. I I really, I, I do need to, it's on my list. Well, let me tell you now. It's a very fucking slow film. Is it? You know how um, Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks directed by the, um, uh, well, the Howard, what's his name? Bryce Dallas Howard's dad. Yeah, oh, God. Ron Howard, Ron. Ron Howard, yeah. The beginning of that, before they're like, they, they take off in the rocket, there's sort of that long lead-up of doing all the tests and everything. That is basically like 90% of the first man. It's so slow, and it's about them talking about doing the missions, and then, oh, this particular mission failed, that particular mission failed, and now we've come together, and we're going to be the mission, oh, we're in, uh, you know, we're going to uh, do this or whatever. And it's it's so slow, but the actual visuals of up on the moon and doing all that is pretty fucking spectacular. I'll have to have a look at it. So it's an interesting film for sure, but I've only seen it once just because of how slow it was, whereas Apollo 13 I've watched countless times. Yeah. So, you probably noticed we haven't really been doing like, or if we have done it, it's been very brief recommendations for people to watch or like little things we're watching in the background due to how intense and how good the films in July have came out. Hence Mission Impossible, hence Barbie, hence Oppenheimer. And this episode would be no different. We won't have that. <laughs> to, give you some type of, to give you some type of idea on top of that, 
is we will be having a few different episodes coming up in August, which won't be about new releases. Purely because there isn't any that many good ones we want to go see, really. Blue Beetle, RC, God out Kieran Will, but I'm only literally seeing that because number one, I'm a comic book fan to a degree. And number two is I like Cobra Kai and I like the chap who plays Miguel Shola and he's playing Miguel O'Hara in Blue Beetle. And it's also four pounds to go to the cinema. So support your cinemas if you can. Yeah, four pound for you is fucking sixteen pound for me. I'm actually intrigued to watch um what's it called? Special Ops Lionesses with Zoe Saldana, Morgan Freeman. Um that's on Paramount Plus, so I need to get myself a Paramount Plus free membership, which is only seven days, which is bullshit. Normally you get for fourteen days to thirteen. You get a month like some places do. Fucking Apple T V, you get I've got you know, a lot of products, you get three, six months, like fucking sort out Paramount Plus. Screen out, I'm telling you. And we'll come get you with our little subscribers. <laughs> but no, Kieran's right. There's plenty of things on Paramount Plus I want to watch. By that I mean, I want to watch Toulouse King, aren't they? I want to watch Lionesses, you're right about that. And Yellowstone. Yellowstone, or, or uh, what's the one, 1923? Is that the one, the spin-off one with Harrison and Helen? That's like the prequel one, yeah. Intrigued in seeing that one. Yeah, some little recommendations there. We haven't seen them yet, but some things we're... We're going to what? Oh, also, I've been watching, in the background, I've been watching the final season of Jack Ryan, um, which I'm enjoying. Uh, Jack, I say, you you haven't gotten into it. You haven't even watched one episode. No. But I do think it, it, it is, you know, if you enjoyed Reacher, uh, obviously, Reacher is not Tom Clancy. It's Lee Childs. But it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. It's not the same thing, but it is the same thing. I'm just going to say that in case anyone picks up on it and goes, it's not the same thing. But it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. If you enjoyed Reacher, you'll enjoy Jack Ryan. I do think Reacher's better, but Jack Ryan is still very much enjoyable. And, I mean, I, I've only watched a couple of episodes of season uh, four, which is the final season of Jack Ryan, but I do think the first season of Jack Ryan is the best season. i say that's a real solid season, that is. And then I think I actually enjoyed season three over two. They're not bad, you know, it's just me being picky. Well, yeah, I wholeheartedly recommend the bear on disney plus to the point where there'll be an upcoming episode on that most likely the next episode yeah so thank you very much for listening and take it easy or hard however you prefer catch you guys in the next one